Good morning and welcome once again to Digital Look TV from London. With us today is Bill Hubart. He is Chief Economist at Markets.com. Mr. Hubart, thank you for joining us once again. Thank you for, excuse me, thank you for asking. Okay. Um, let's start off. Uh, the U.S. Federal Reserve, the minutes from the last F FOMC policy get-together. Markets have reacted. They, were, they, li they elicited quite a noticeable reaction from capital markets. Some people are talking all of a sudden about the possibility of a Fed taper. Not everyone. What is your take on that? Has something really changed? No, not, not at all. To me, what they basically said was re reiterated, reinforced my feeling that tapering will begin in March. Mm -hmm. They also reiterated, you know, they will look more towards data dependency slash forward guidance. And I think they probably have to uh, bullard the, the president from St. Louis. Th they may now readjust their excuse me, not only their inflation, but also their employment thing. I would, I would expect probably they, they may ad adjust their employment rate from 7 to 6.5%, but it did not change my feeling. But now one of the things where people may have gotten somewhat confused if they stayed up that late mm -hmm. till 7 o'clock last night, mm -hmm. we did see a very strong movement in the dollar. But I think that had started earlier in London time yesterday afternoon when, when Bloomberg reported special people who know the situation right. figured that the ECB may look to do negative interest rates. Mm -hmm. Now that turned a, a dollar sell position in the morning to people were, were buying the dollar. So you saw the euro really move like 75, 80 pips there. Mm -hmm. I think that continued into the FOMC meeting because I think more of that was trading off the New York desk. But to me, what I saw was at least the reinforcement of my feeling that we don't get tapering until March was where the dollar did sell off in Asia and where we saw the sell off in the Asian stock markets feeling that no, they'll, they will be, you know, rates will be lower for longer and tapering will not start until, until the March meeting. So in the final, as a conclusion more or less, the Fed, the final takeaway from that, from those minutes is they really were not more aggressive. Rather, they were still quite cautious, dovish. Yes, I think so. Cautiously dovish. And, and most people feel that, you know, Janet Yellen, if she is selected as chairperson of the Federal Reserve, mm -hmm. she is as dovish as Mr. Bernanke is. And one of the things they keep talking about is moderate to modest growth. And we're, we're seeing that throughout. And of course, one of the things that is not helping the Fed Reserve was the October shutdown, okay, for those 17 days. Mm -hmm. And it still is probably affecting the data. Mm -hmm. The simple fact is, what did that do to consumer confidence in the U.S., mm -hmm. what it did to retail sales in the U.S., et cetera, et cetera. Now, you know, we talked about this before. Will all this be blown away mm -hmm. when we get non-farm payrolls on the 6th of December? What happens if we get 250, 275, 300,000? But as we were talking about earlier, I think that probably any increase in employment over the next probably six to eight weeks will be probably, quote, temporary employment for the Thanksgiving Christmas holiday period. Okay, fantastic. Um, okay, let's move from the Fed to the ECB. But they have perhaps, amongst others, uh, one common denominator, talk of a negative deposit rate. You were telling me before the interview started that negative deposit rates in and of themselves are disinflationary. That sounds rather dangerous. Well, and, and, exactly. And this is one of the things that, that, that if we didn't learn this from the Bank of Japan for all those years, and this is the problem. I mean, no matter what we're looking at, you know, in, in my generation, remember inflation 15, 18, and I remember October 79 in the states of 28.9%. Now we're looking at 1.5, 1.8, 2.2, .2, so, so in, inflation is not a problem anywhere. But also the simple fact is, is, is we see this here in, in the UK and also in the Eurozone, you know, that when they were doing the one, two, and three year LTROs, mm -hmm. it was cheap funding. But what were the banks doing with that funding? Keeping their hands in the pocket. So, so it wasn't going out to the reason for being it, okay? Lending you money, lending you money, lending mm -hmm. you money, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, but I mean, one of the things that we have to look at is when, when, the ECB surprised the market, and I was surprised. I was expecting the rate cut to be in December, not this month, okay? Mm -hmm. We, for the first time ever, you know, there was, the, again, unnamed sources saying, mm -hmm. you know, that, that there were a number of people, at least 25% of the your governing council was against it. And of course, we know that Jens Weidemann was. And as soon as this came out yesterday, he said, absolutely no way. The, Ger the Germans would not even consider looking at something like that. Mm -hmm. to help their fellow members of the European Union, team players as they are, of course. Of course. <laughs> okay, um, the ECB then, 
If negative deposit rates might be one, a step too far for now, certainly for now at least, what might it do? Might it do something else, something well, more? Well, I, I, you know, I, I guess I'm just a member of the old school. I don't know all these new new term negative deposit rates and LTRO. I mean, I thought maybe that was you know a Formula One call, but you know what do I know? But the simple fact is, I, I still think that we could see another interest rate cut by the European Central Bank. I mean, I think that's the the basics that everybody really truly understands. Okay, so the euro dollar, the exchange rate factors it factors large into the ECB's decision. Where do we see that going next, say, three, six months? Well, uh, I mean, I've been bearish the euro since January 1999. I think when it was trading at 82 to 86p to the, to the dollar, I thought that was probably a better level than, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I just remember, like, two, let's say three weeks ago, when we saw the euro at 137.20, I think every journalist, every analyst was waiting for the Q&A from, last, from this month's ECB meeting. The Super Mario, what are you going to do at 139? What are you going to do at 140? Exactly. Uh, he'd have a heart attack. And I think what he did was they predicated that, said, well, let's do it now. And as we saw that, we saw the euro sell off about, you know, 150 pips. And now I think it's back to you know, 135, you know, to level. And it's, but, but you see, I still think that's a short. And I still think, you know, What's it going to do to Bulgaria? What's it going to do to Romania? What's it going to do to Italy? What is it going to do to Spain? I mean, I was in Milan over the weekend, and they were all bitching and moaning and complaining. I mean, these are just the person in the street. A high euro is just hurting business at a time when nobody wants business to be hurting, and nobody wants more austerity. That's a very interesting point you've touched upon, uh, Eastern Europe. When trying to get more than gauge demand for the single currency, but trying to forecast where it might go, anticipate the moves in the currency. Eastern Europe, in aggregate, yeah. fund you, flows. What you've got to look at is, yes, h- how much of the euro moving against the dollar, 134, 135, 137, was euro dollar. I, I think probably maybe not even half of that. Because one of the things you've got to look at is you s- when, when you had this, you, you saw the Indonesian rupee, mm. you saw the Indian rupee, you saw the Turkish lira get hit. Also, the simple fact is you were having Poland, Hungary, the Czech Republic, Turkish lira, all selling into the euro, okay? Hence the reason, we saw this five or six years ago before the housing bubble, mm-hmm. bubble exploded. You had massive house building, massive house purchases in Eastern Europe, okay? They were all selling their currencies to buy the euro, okay? And then the euro was going, and they were making all these mortgages were in the Swiss franc. Hence the reason, you know, that Switzerland has seen this twice now in the last seven years about these money flows out of Eastern Europe into the euro and then into Swiss franc. Hence the Swiss National Bank pegging uh, the Swiss E against the euro at, you know, at the 125 level. But I think that's what's difficult for some of our maybe single traders to look at is, mm-hmm. is the peripheral trades mm-hmm. that are having either a positive or a negative effect on, on maybe the trade that they're looking at, whether it be against the yen, whether it be against sterling or whether it be against the dollar. Okay. Bank of Japan. Uh, we had the monetary policy meeting and the dollar yen. Some traders I hear uh, are expecting the yen to weaken even further. You do not support that. I'm deal. in the 103, 105 level. And even talking when we're looking at to say even six, nine months time, we still see it steady. Well, I think what we got to look at is the 31st of March. Okay. That's the end of the Japanese fiscal year. Right. And anybody who's ever followed Japanese companies, they sort of have to make a uh, a, a sort of proposal to the Bank of Japan. And I'm not saying that the Bank of Japan will manipulate the currency. Of course, no, no central bank would ever do that. But the simple fact is, at 103, 104, 105, companies, maybe you've heard of Toyota, Samsung, Nissan, et cetera, et cetera. This is positive for them. Uh, 110, 112, 115, that may be too silly positive. So I can't look at six months. I have to look at between now and close to the 31st of March next year. Okay, so steady as you go in the dollar yen. Cable, uh, do we see that weakening from here, perhaps strengthening a little bit more and then turning back down again? Well, I, I see cable, again, probably 161, 162, 163. The, the Bank of England and UK businesses can't be pleased with cable being at that kind of level, okay? Because especially the simple fact is, if it's too strong, remember, re- remember and I, I know this sounds silly, the UK exports more to Belgium than we do to China, okay? So, you know, in, in a, a lot of people, the play has been, uh, has been euro sterling rather than euro dollar, and there's been far more of a play 
in that currency over the past over a couple of months. Okay, one possible intriguing uh, possibility, which I read, but I cannot remember the source to be honest, is a, a small appreciation, a small further appreciation in sterling. It does imply a certain degree of, monet of tightening in monetary conditions. It's a bit covert or under the table, perhaps Mr. Carney is not completely Well, I think one of the things th that people may have missed right, is the simple fact is the reason why we've had a very strong uh, sterling over the past six months is uh, Merlin IPO, Royal Mail IPO, and the number of hotel chains and stuff and properties that are being bought here in the UK. Mm -hmm. So we see, we're seeing that is having far more of an effect. We talk about foreign monies coming in. Uh, I mean, what do, what do we think? Qatar or something owns like 8, 10% or something of the Royal Mail shares. So, so that's, that's what you're seeing, okay, is the simple fact is we are seeing uh, the equity market here in the UK and the IPO market having a very, very positive effect on both the FTSE, the IPO market, but if you're looking at it from, a, from where cable is, mm -hmm. it's having a negative effect because people are having to sell whatever they're owning buying cable to buy Royal Mail, to buy Merlin IPO, to, to buy you know, in another little little stock that everybody's buying is a thing called Plus 500, okay? Mm -hmm, indeed. Uh, are they, okay, so foreign investors, are they just, for the UK, foreign investors are simply buying beaten down assets or are they giving a thumbs up to the economic outlook for the UK? I think a combination of both, okay? okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, what we've seen in this country, you know, has always been a for, you know, foreign direct investment, okay? You know, when I first came over, it was, it was the Saudis, you know, then it was the Russians, and of course now, you know, it, you know, the, the, you know the, the Middle East, again, is everywhere. I mean, if you saw the, you know, the Francis Bacon uh, no, I did not. Uh, picture that was sold last week, the triptych of Lucian Freud, no. sold for $142 million, right? Good Lord. In right. six minutes, okay? Amazing, okay. It was bought, bought by the... Qatar royal family. She only has a billion dollars a year to spend on art. <laughs> Not so, much I so, got so I'm, <laughs> I'm getting out my crayons. <laughs> I, 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 I don't want to lie. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, that's a fantastic point. Um, and then lastly, uh, you touched a little bit on this point a little bit earlier. China yeah. uh, looms large in every sense sure. and for a long time to come. There were reforms just announced by the third plenum of the Communist Party's Central Committee. Are they truly that important, that relevant, that positive? Uh, well, it shows that they're thinking ahead, but you've got to understand the oriental mind, okay? Mm. Where we think ahead is maybe two years, five years. They're talking a thousand, a hundred years, okay? Mm. Re remember, I mean, Mao said, you know, a march of a thousand miles starts mm. with the first move, okay? And that's what you have to look at. I mean, I mean time is immaterial to them, okay? It, it's a positive move, but will it happen you know, we, we did see the dollar come under pressure for four or five hours after that happened. Mm -hmm. But I mean, if you're following what's really happening in China, I, I always follow the Aussie dollar. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's a situation where I have to go back to what uh, maybe it was the first plenum or something, you know, 15, 12, 15 years ago when, uh -huh. when this government first took over. Mm -hmm. and, and he said, you know, we, we, are, we are one economy with two currencies, okay? Okay. And of course, the major currency, of course, is the Hong Kong dollar. It has been since, you know, 1945 or whatever you want to say. So, you know, so, so much of their business is done through Hong Kong, through Macau, through the, through, through the dollar. Now, maybe, maybe not. I mean, I think we, what we, we did see was, you know, when this happened the other day, the non-deliverable forward market between Japanese yen and the Chinese renminbi went to a 20-year high, okay? Well, but, but, but that, but again, that's, non-deliverable forwards, okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, the, the, the last time, you know, and I was, I was, as I, said, I was in Milan over the weekend, uh, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't exchange my pound sterling for Chinese renminbi, mm -hmm. you know, at the American Express you know, foreign exchange counter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, I, and I don't see that changing, you know, anytime soon, okay? okay. Two years, three years, five years. I mean, it, it, we're all talking about it will probably happen, but I will, I will, I will, last thing I want to mention is when this does, this will, this will have been through months, years of discussion with all the central banks, because you know as well as I do, if they decide to flood the market with, with a convertible currency, you know. Things will change. Yes, uh, I, mean, I mean, you know, it'll be a situation, it, it will be China, and it'll be worse than ECB, it'll be China, and, and 225 other little dwarfs. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> okay. And on that note, uh, Mr. Hubert. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. And that's all from us here at Digital Look TV for, from London. Until next time, thank you.